I'm really uh, pleased and excited to be here today to talk about elections. I spent 30 years of my career in elections in Ottawa and um, Manitoba and different locations around uh, the globe. And even today, after having retired a few years ago, I, I maintain a great uh, interest and a great uh, passion in the importance of elections. So congratulations on this uh, conference and thank you for having this opportunity. And today, what I'd like to speak with you about is the legal framework for elections and specifically uh, at the federal level. And so then we'll be talking mostly about the Canada Elections Act. And I'll be commenting about how the framework was in transition going into the 2015 general election. And that looking forward, we can expect transition uh, to continue, including in some new and potentially game-changing ways. And I think that will fit interestingly with some of the other panelists. You know, electoral reform <coughs> is a hot topic these days. Uh, particularly in uh, political and academic and uh, media circles. And I think it's going to remain that way for some time. And I think that uh, over the coming months, we're also going to see a very substantial increase in public attention being paid to electoral reform. So I think we can all agree <coughs> there is the method, <coughs> excuse me, there is a method by which um, people transfer their authority to elected representatives that elections are fundamentally important, of course, to individuals and to society at large. And it's a legal framework that provides that structure within which free and fair elections can take place amidst the, the partisan competition that has come to be described uh, as hyperpartisanship. And certainly, it's a, I think that's a fitting term. So although it's the, you know, the horse race nature of elections that gets our attention and gets the media headlines, there's something that's much more fundamental at stake when we talk about electoral reform. As the European Commission succinctly put it and, and properly focuses for us, elections are examples of human rights in practice. The purpose then of the legal framework is to ensure that free and fair elections are conducted according to the rule of law. The legal framework establishes the rules of the game. And of course, it's only one part, of the legal framework is legislation. That's what we'll talk about today. There are international agreements, constitutional provisions, regulatory rules, judicial interpretation, but today we're going to focus in, in my presentation, on the legislation. Because it's the legislation that really gives us the most comprehensive uh, view of elections in Canada and the best notion of the operational direction. And these laws are not static. Uh, they're both tested and they change over time. And some changes seem to fit on a continuum. And they seem to be, you might practically expect to change. Others seem to be departures from the norm, and yet others appear to be flat out outliers. But in general, I believe it may be said that the broad substantive sweep of changes to electoral law in Canada uh, include at least the following four themes. First, improving accessibility to the franchise. Second, restricting the disproportional impact of money in elections, so-called leveling the playing field. Third, entrenching the independence and professionalism of electoral administration. And in this case, we're talking about the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada, the CEO, as I'll refer, and Elections Canada. And finally, recognizing political parties and candidates as legal entities that are subject to regulation when it's in the public interest. But now I'd add to this mix a fifth possible focus that could be the game changer I referred to earlier, and that's altering the basic framework in terms of our underlying system of representation. And you know, it, it's also my experience, uh, having been involved in major legislative reform under governments of different political stripes in Manitoba, that at least three elements need to be present for successful electoral reform. Firstly, the political will to proceed the content of the reform, <clears throat> and the process. And I want to stress that the content is important, obviously, but so too is the process. The process is very important to the legitimacy of the outcoming electoral laws or the changes to laws. So when we look at 2015, um, the electoral laws, again, were revisited and there were changes. And, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by that because that uh, typically happens. But what was different last time around was that there was deep and broad disagreement over whether some of the changes contained in the Fair Elections Act were at odds with historical trends of accessibility and independence of the CEO and leveling the financial playing field. 
<clears throat> now, these, um, these issues and the debate is probably familiar to many of you, so, and it's a topic really of another, another panel. But the main point for our purpose today is that in this election, as a direct result of the Fair Elections Act and the way in which it came about, um, there was a national debate and there was public engagement over the issue of the legal framework for elections. And I think that engagement debate is a good thing. So, uh, going forward, um, what factors might influence the sort of changes that we can anticipate down the road? Certainly, uh, there will be changes arising from the Fair Elections Act, but it's unlikely that that would be the only driver for change. I think the nature of the last election, as well as government policy, are expected to be important. But while speaking of the Fair Elections Act, I think there are a couple things that look destined to be rolled back, and uh, that would include use of the voter identification card. It would include um, the role of the chief electoral officer in public information. It would likely to be reinstated and, and probably be expanded to expressly include promotion of the vote. And finally, some change directed to the independent status of the commissioner of elections, who's the enforcement official, uh, to make clear that that officer reports directly to Parliament. In fact, the Liberal Election Party platform you know, promises to do these things. So clearly, the Fair Elections Act will continue to be a force in future change. But as well, I believe that the particular dynamics of the last election um, leading up to this uh, are also um, going to, is also going to be a force for change. I think that there were a number of, uh, as well, investigations and prosecutions leading into the last election that will be a focus for change as well. But in terms of the particular dynamics of the last election, I want to just address a couple points. Um, firstly, the fixed date election, the extended campaign period, the performance, uh, there will be an audit of the performance of electoral officials. And finally, I'll refer to the investigations and prosecutions I touched on just a moment ago. But first to the fixed date election. You know, as you're familiar, since 2007, federal legislation has provided for fixed date elections, but in fact, 2015, turns out to be our very first experience with a fixed date election in Canada. So it's not entirely surprising that um, there would be need to go back and to review our laws with a real-time experience, which we have now. For one thing, the advent of fixed date elections uh, makes much more likely and almost a certainty a continual election campaigns, permanent election campaigns. You know, in the past when elections were called purely at the, at the will of the government, political parties and candidates would play a guessing game. When might that be? And it's difficult for them to map out and to maximize their spending uh, when they weren't sure of the election date. But now with a fixed date to work with, parties and candidates are able to coordinate their spending in such a way to maximize both their election period spending, which is limited, and importantly, their spending outside the election period, which is not limited. So now, depending on the size of the war chest, it may be possible for the best resourced political parties and candidates to effectively extend the election period to their choosing and to be able to spend increasing and unlimited amounts of money in Canadian elections. Now, one approach to regulate this could be as found in Manitoba. Uh, when we uh, proposed fixed date elections and, and they were enacted, there was an accompanying amendment which said that in the year of a fixed date election, political entities were limited in the amount of money that they could spend. So it's something perhaps a departure point for discussion. A second instructional aspect from the last uh, general election was the, le the lengthy 11-week election period. Um, and that's interesting because that long period combined with some amendments to the Elections Act, through the Fair Elections Act, brings our attention to the matter of leveling the financial playing field. You know, it's the Prime Minister's office that will determine the length of the campaign, provided that it's uh, the election period, provided it's at least 37 days. But importantly, up to the last election, the election period um, really just meant that um, the candidates had more or less time to spend the same amount of money. The spending limit applied to the election period. It wasn't varied. But with an amendment to the uh, Elections Act under the Fair Elections Act, now, spending goes up during the election period. It's adjusted where the election period is longer than the minimum. And the bottom line of this impact was that in the 2015 election, the spending limit was basically double what it had been before, up to around $55 million. And importantly, then those with greater resources 
can spend to what is a new and I would underline unanticipated maximum that's determined by government while others are caught off guard. And I think this needs attention. Then there's the audit of election administration. Um, this results from a Supreme Court decision in a 2012 uh, recount, uh, recount that um, was reviewed in 2012 and it focused public attention on what happens at the voting place, the performance of election officials in a really detailed way. And although the Supreme Court in a 4-3 decision was able to determine and provide direction to when do you count a valid ballot in the face of administrative error, it did also focus really detailed attention on that error and found that it was widespread in the division that was under review. Elections Canada subsequently studied the matter on a national level and found that indeed uh, record keeping error and mistakes on the parts of officials are rampant um, across uh, the country, not limited to one single division. And one concrete outcome of this was the Canada Elections Act been amended so that following a general or by-election, there will be an audit of the performance of the election officials. And so we can anticipate from what we already know that there will be some changes to record keeping and the procedures that take place at, at the polls, which of course will be likely to impact the experience of voting. And the federal CEO has already mentioned that these kinds of changes will, will require legislative amendment. I mentioned the other theme of revision, and that has been to recognize political parties and candidates as legal entities subject to regulation in the public interest. You know, in the light of the number of election-related investigations and prosecutions leading up to 2015, it seems to me that it's time to address the matter of integrity in political campaigning. And specifically here, I'm referring to a matter of um, ethical conduct. There is precedent in Manitoba, arising from a judicial inquiry in 1998 um, there uh, became the need for the parties to adopt a uh, code of ethics, and in fact, we exceeded that mark by arriving at a shared code of ethical conduct, agreed to by all the registered political parties. It's something that can be improved upon for certain, but it's, uh, but it's the beginning. I want to close then on um, the point of system change, the game-changing idea of uh, changing or altering our underlying system of representation. Because to this point, we've talked about things that more or less touch on the broad themes identified at the outset. But presently, of course, we have the promise in the Liberal Party election uh, platform that to ensure that 2015 will be the last federal election conducted under the first past the vote system. And as part of the promise review of electoral reform, which will also look at mandatory voting and online voting, um, ranked ballots, proportional representation, and other systems of representation will be looked at. Um, and legislation's promise within, within 18 months of taking government. So the clock's already ticking. And yet, all sorts of considerations arise from this idea. Whether or not the government can properly claim an electoral mandate for its reform process or any, proce or any system of representation that arises. Public opinion, the nature of citizen deliberation and consultation. Whether a referendum is required for legitimacy and all that goes with that, including framing the question, forming committees, setting financial regulations. Editorial opinion already lining up in favor of a referendum. Partisan political disagreements already underway with respect to the process. The Liberals prefer a special committee without a referendum, and the Tories demand a referendum. Process matters, as seen in the Fair Elections Act. Possible <coughs> parliamentary tactics, um, such as filibuster, what will be the role of the Senate, the Prime Minister's personal uh, preference expressed for the preferential ballot system, and perception in some quarters, whether that's true or not, of system change for political advantage. And the big question, whether in any event, a large-scale change like this is even within the authority of Parliament without the consent of the provinces. The likelihood of legal challenges and such a timeline to employ this by 2019. So you add to all those issues the fact that there is no one perfect system of electoral representation, and we can see that electoral reform is going to be a hot topic, and it's going to continue to increase in its attention over the coming time. So the legal framework itself for elections, it remains a structural underpinning for free and fair elections, uh, consistent with the basic human right to vote and to be a candidate in genuine and periodic elections. And that's a very important statement when we stand back from everything. But let's keep in mind then that the changes to the legal framework should be assessed against this end. And that this should be the proper lens that we look at, that we look through when we consider whether electoral reform is positive or not positive. So with those comments, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I look forward greatly to hearing the other panelists and our discussion to come. Thank you.
comment on this impact of technology on democracy and as it's expressed through elections. Um, and there's nothing necessarily, uh, you know, beneficial about it. I mean, I don't make that conclusion that because it's technologically possible, it's, it's absolutely beneficial. Um, sometimes it can be beneficial. Uh, you can have a continuous list and you can have apps on your phone and help you find, you know, how to connect to your candidates and where to go to vote, things like this. Sometimes it can be put to very bad uses with a robocall examples which threatens the foundation of, of democracy and the values that we hold. And sometimes it can be something in between where it's a shiny new penny, but we better think twice before we jump on it. And I would say online voting is one of those things. And I was often asked as a CEO in Manitoba, um, you know, when will we have online voting? And the way I look at it is not the technological possibility, but what are the values, like echoing something as Jonathan said, what are the values that, that are behind this? What do we value in elections? We value secrecy. We value one person, one vote. You know, these are the kinds of the, the things that give us legitimacy in our elected representatives. How do we translate that online? The banks live with 4% fraud. I said, are you prepared to live with 4% fraud? I'm not. I don't know how you roll out online voting other than kiosks, or manage kiosks to make it quicker, but I, I don't know how you roll it onto a home. So those are examples of nothing necessarily benign nor beneficial about technology, but we am glad we're having this discussion because we sure better get a good grip on it because it's being used in campaigning hugely and uh, it's being considered to be rolled out in the, in the act of voting. And we can't threaten the base. It's an excellent question, and I also want to piggyback on you, piggybacking uh, on uh, Tamara's comment about, just before I answer your other question, about uh, media being used to engage people who are already engaged. And it's interesting in online voting, another application of technology, that where, it's, uh, where there is online voting in Canada at municipal level in several places, um, the studies have shown now that the people who vote online are the same people who would have voted otherwise. They're engaged, they're voters. It's just simpler for me to do it from home. So it's, it, hasn't ga it hasn't engaged other people. And that really transitions into your question. How do you engage people who are unlikely to be um, voters? Um, and so the first comment is be careful of the silver bullets. And I think that a lot of people hold out online voting as a silver bullet, and I don't think it is. And I think the research is starting to show that. Not that it doesn't have any value, but it's not a silver bullet. Uh, I think the big is practical way you do it is accessibility. Um, this time, Elections Canada on the federal level, they had one more day of advanced voting and they moved the advanced vote to more convenient locations and advanced voting went up 71%. And what percentage of those voters would have voted anyway, I don't know, because overall turnout was up near 10%, but certainly that's a big impact. First thing I would do is I would increase advanced voting at a practical level. Second thing, I would open up advanced voting to anyone. In Manitoba, we have a system um, it's, it's unique, but the system is that you can go to any advance poll and vote. So we have them at the airports, movie theaters, and campuses, and all over the place. And so you just happen to be, our theory was, you're living your life, let's put voting right in front of you, and if we make it so you don't have a lot of investment for the return on voting, that's a calculation people just inherently, they make. It's not worth the effort, it's not worth my time. Oh, it's right there? Sure, it takes a minute, and I'll, I'll do it. The bigger question, of course, is many people are disenchanted with with politics and the system, and that may be a longer term answer, and that may be educational. And most uh, electoral institutions, if they're permitted, and one thing that was taken away under the Fair Elections Act, was that education, for example, in Manitoba, um, the power to choose, which is the initiative of Elections Manitoba, is part of the curriculum in school. So a longer term, hopefully, that'll have an impact. Yeah, no, um, registration in, in Canada is you have to be on a list. Now, we may start with a database with you on the list, but we'll try to confirm that you're still on the list in some way. It varies by jurisdiction. Sure, Well, it, it's a continuous registry federally, which comes through taxes, but through other ways, too, that you can uh, get on the list. And the federal CEO wants to start engaging kids when they're 16 years old, not qualified yet to vote, but to get them on the list and move them that way. Firstly, not all reform, electoral reform, it doesn't have the context that it's positive necessarily. And the Fair Elections Act is a great example of that, where sure. citizens groups across the country, um, elites, political scientists and others, but also just people really um, had a lot of difficulty with the Fair Elections Act. And I think it was a, it was a organized effort, but it, but it was also a grassroots up effort. I would make a, the second point is that it's interesting in Canada, the way we look at I think your premise is correct. It's, it's, all, it's political. It absolutely is. How do we then attempt to regulate it? If you look at the U.S. and many other places, they attempt to regulate it by a bipartisan arrangement between the political actors. That's what they do in the U.S. And elsewhere, they have commissions of political actors. 
In Canada, we, in 1920, created a position called the Chief Electoral Officer, which was unique. It was a world leadership example. This is the person appointed by Parliament at the, at the uh, benefit of Parliament's confidence to run elections and to try to sort out um, the political advantage, to try to remove the political advantage as much as possible, the extent possible, from the laws and the practices. And the best argument in favor of a referendum, if you were to go that route, uh, is that there's a terrible conflict of interest of allowing the politicians who are now in Ottawa to decide the future system that they'll run on. Yeah. And I don't know, that's the ultimate example of the political nature of this, and I don't know how you allow that to happen without tremendous consultative uh, deliberation in advance or some other type of uh, referendum or something like that. Mm -hmm.